in just a few minutes, probably uh, about 535, just waiting for everyone to show up. Um, but thanks for being here and we appreciate that and we will see you in just a few.
Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here for our presentation this evening. And I want to wish you a happy spring. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce myself uh, to you. My name is Sean Gilmore, and I'm the incoming chair of the FOCAP Steering Committee. I will be replacing Carol Miraben, who, along with Liz Cruz, has generous, generously volunteered to serve with me to make sure our transition runs smoothly. They will both also continue as members of the committee. And I know we are all extremely grateful for that. Carol has been a tremendous leader. Thank you both Carol and Liz, and also thank you to the Museum of New Mexico Foundation and Kristen Graham, along with the great staff of the Museum of Art, uh, the curators, and last but not least, our entire FOCAP steering committee. It's been kind of a crazy year, a little bit odd, a little bit disconcerting, but I'm very happy to say that there's so much on the horizon to look forward to. Uh, we're looking forward to maybe having in-person events later in the year. Uh, and the prospect of hosting these larger in-person events has us all very, very excited. Uh, we've been having lots of lively discussions on what to do about future programming, and we will be more than excited to announce these to you very, very soon. Look forward to that. I also wanted to alert you to the fact that the Museum of Art is open now if you haven't been by to visit. Uh, it's at a limited capacity and is very safe. And there are two exhibits right at the moment that are of particular interest. Um, Alcove's 2020 number four with artists Karsten Creighton, Phyllis Ideal, JC Gonzo, Cara Romero, and Donald Woodman. And also Breathless, curated by Catherine Ware which consists of 18 artists working in a variety of media who consider the fascinating subject of breath from an endless variety of perspectives. These are both beautiful shows. Please come and see them. And now I would like to welcome Mary Scully Museum of Art Head of Curatorial Affairs. I would also like to mention to you about a new webinar that we've got coming on May 4th. Um, and that will be highlighting Catherine Ware's exhibit of Breathless and one of the artists from that exhibit, Jill O'Brien. And Jill, uh, it should be a fascinating presentation. Jill has been working with the idea of breath as an integral part of her work for many, many years. Her drawings and paintings are subtle, nuanced evocations of the concept. Um, I want to quote from an article I found in The Magazine, uh, which describes it concisely. Her work converses in material residues of breath, body, sky, water, stone, paper. That describes it pretty well. Her work has also been in the collections of the Brooklyn Museum, Colby Museum of Art, and the National Gallery of Art Library, among others. So please join us for that on May 4th, and you'll get notice of that pretty quickly. Uh, let's get back to Mary. <laughs> Mary Scully is our New Mexico Museum of Art. Head of Curatorial Affairs, and Mary will be speaking with Amy Ellenson and Deborah Baxter, two of the five artists from our last Alcove's presentation of 2020 number three. We were all really excited to meet these artists at the museum itself and see their work when unfortunately the pandemic raised its mighty fist and thwart thwarted those hopes. <laughs> I know I'm happy to be able to review their work. Some of us were able to see it in the gallery, but weren't able to actually speak with the artists and 
Now we can get to know them and what makes them tick during today's exchange. So thank you both for taking part. And now thank you to Mary and here's Mary. Okay, thank you so much, Sean. Um, I also wanna thank Liz Cruz and Carol Mirabin, as well as Jonna Gottschalk and Christian Graham for um, doing the magic behind the scenes. I'm happy to be here. It's always a pleasure to share exciting and interesting art and artists with you. These virtual programs are intended to mimic the in-gallery informal conversations that we used to be able to hold in the alcove galleries. Some of you may have attended the last virtual conversation with artist Karsten Kreitney and Phyllis Ideal. So we are, that was a big success and we are very excited to welcome Deborah Baxter and Amy Ellingson tonight to have a conversation. And Deborah and Amy will both present a little bit about their work. Uh, we'll have some uh, exchange maybe while we're having the slideshow and then uh, break into a conversation. And throughout the presentations and the conversation, please um, contribute questions or ideas into the Q&A. We may not get to them as right at that moment, but we will also have a Q&A session at the very end. So thank you so much for being here and welcome Deborah and Amy. And biggest thank you to you both for agreeing to do this. It's great to be here, thank you. Excellent. Well, as um, Sean said, this, was, this alcove opened really the first night that people I knew were being cautious about handshaking and uh, all of this uh, new experience uh, was just beginning. So, um, I we were we were elbow bumping at the opening. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I thought it would be great to recheck in with you guys. And um, without further ado, why don't we let Deborah um, start sharing some of her slides? Okay, got it. All right, really excited to be here. Um, so these are the last, the first couple of photos are just photographs of my alcove itself. I really wanted to get pictures of people in it because it was so exciting to have the openings in person. It, it feels like the last fun thing I got to do with a big group of people. So it has a very special place in my heart. Um, so these are my first pieces. Um, the, the, sorry, my breastplate pieces, they are Victorian um, blouses that are kind of transformed into armor for ladies. Um, for whatever reason, over the years, I've come to believe or uh, use crystals as a way to symbolize power. It could be from, I think it's from the original Superman movie in the Fortress of Solitude, to be perfectly honest. Um, this is the most recent breastplate that I made for Ruth Bader Ginsburg right after she died. Uh, I guess I use my art to process my feelings and a lot of grief. So I wanted to take her larger than life achievements of personality and uh, make it in this crazy warrior spiked uh, breastplate. So this is, was not in the alcove show, but it's an example of how I've figured out a way to turn lace and fabric into metal. So I hired a lace maker to make um, lace in the shape of ninja throwing stars. And uh, yeah, and then I had it made into metal. There's a lot of holes in the back of my studio because I had so much fun throwing it. These are a couple examples of my uh, crystal brass knuckles. So. These are very interesting phenomena that I've, I have yet to completely wrap my brain around um, the way the world has responded to them because they have been going viral since 2009. Um, they're basically this mashup of hip hop, badass street, and then new agey, woo woo, metaphysical. Um, so this tool of healing and destruction in one. The one on the right is in the Smithsonian. There's one in the Albuquerque Museum as well. So not to alarm you with this semi-gross image, but I wanted to show you guys a picture of 
what a, a ghost heart actually is. So a ghost heart is when you, um, not me, but Dr. Doris Taylor figured out a way to scrub a heart of its cells. And then what is left is the DNA scaffolding. When you reintroduce stem cells, the heart starts beating again. So I would highly recommend like Googling it or um, looking up Science Friday and it's it's the craziest thing you've ever seen. And it's it's basically, other than it just seems so luminous and gorgeous to me, this this heart pumping, it, it stemmed this whole body of work kind of about something de dead being coming alive again. So that's part of where my anatomical heart series has come from. Several are out of glass. I have a, I have a cast, uh, a glass kiln in my studio and I've learned to cast glass. Um, this one's uh, bronze and has a door that opens revealing the magical crystals inside. So this piece I wanted to show you because it's an example of the way I take the ready-made and the handmade and kind of fuse them together. And the ready-made is this term Duchamp came up with to talk about a found object. So I, a lot of times my work is taking a found object and an object that uh, I have made from scratch and combines them. So this is another image just to show you an example of what stemmed another body of work is these hands are from Victorian grave st stones. I'm super interested in the Victorian era because of the, for many reasons, but the bizarre uh, um, mourning practices. But anyway, this symbolizes the hand of the person that just died being led to the other side by someone, a loved one that has already died. And I just, I find this idea so beautiful and um, comforting when you're going through grief of a loved one dying. So I made several pieces with hands with them, kind of some of them are reaching towards each other. Um, these I did not make, although I wish I did. They are in the Met Museum, but I wanted to show you my interest in um, statuary, busts, um, the history of stone sculpture, fragmented busts. So I've worked with busts for several years and a lot of what I do is subvert them and remove their face, faces, put them slightly angled um, to change the history of what the story they're telling. The, is my understanding is the Greeks, when someone died, they used to make these wax um, face, face masks. And then they decided that didn't last long enough. So they started carving faces uh, in stone to commemorate someone. So the piece on the right is the most recent and it has to do with the, uh, so it has a log splitter in it, an actual log splitter that I got at a garage sale. Splitting this open, open and I made it in July, right in the middle of um, the racial uprising, rising um, wildfires, uh, pandemic, awesome pandemic and uh, political exhaustion. I just lost, you know, it, it was a rough year. And so some of my work shows the way I felt split open, literally. So this is my last image. And so at the very beginning of the pandemic, like two weeks after our opening, I was freaking out probably like most people because we didn't understand what was happening. And I was having a lot of anxiety, unable to sleep. And then I saw on Instagram, this artist in Canada, Dan Danielle Krista had this idea of how about we all do a piece of art a day for 30 days and put them up on Instagram. And it was um, under the hashtag 30 day art quarantine. And uh, I guess there's 30,000 entries now. But anyway, so I made a sculpture a day for 30 days and I found it to be very grounding and just a fun exercise when you're trapped at home. And, you know, I think for me working this way is sometimes fun to just bust out work quickly and then you're more experimental and things are less precious. And uh, it's not so much about a perfect, perfect finished product. So that's all I got. <clears throat> what was the name of the piece with the log splitter? Split. Okay, that's <laughs> clever, huh? No. <laughs> 
So should we go on to Amy and then we'll start our conversation? I'm already seeing a lot of interesting crossover between the way you both work. Okay. Okay. Well, I, it's funny. I, you know, Deborah and I, I think on the surface looks like we don't have a lot in common and yet I feel such a kinship with her. Um, and I think, you know, you're, you're so like juxtaposing crazy things that kind of don't go together. And I feel in a way that I'm doing the same. There's a lot of things I put into my paintings that I'm kind of shoehorning things together. So um, I think we could talk about that a little bit. But uh, here's a shot of my alcove installation. And um, it consisted of the big oil and encaustic painting, um, two graphite drawings, two lithographs, and 10 glazed porcelain sculptures. So I'm going to just quickly talk about those works, talk a little bit about some of the ideas behind the work, and then end with some more recent stuff. Um, the painting is called Variation Bridge, um, White Black Pink. And the, the bridge reference, this painting was started in San Francisco where I lived for 25 years. I moved to Santa Fe in October of 2018 and built a studio here. So for about six months, I didn't have a studio, which drove me out of my mind, of course. But this painting had been started in San Francisco and once I moved into the studio, it was, you know, the first thing that I unwrapped and it was just wonderful to have something to kind of jump into right away. So this is really the first thing that I made after moving here. Um, all of my work is designed on the computer and has been since 1990. And, you know, that is when the first version of Photoshop was released. Um, Illustrator, I think, was on its second or third version already. And um, I was at CalArts, it was 1990, I was getting my MFA and I kind of gingerly stepped into the computer lab and thought, hmm, maybe there's a way to use a computer and use computer graphics programs to kind of advance the project of abstraction, which was, you know, very much under assault at CalArts. Um, so I'll talk a little more about that. Um, the two graphite drawings in my alcove show, um, are basically drawings of the painting in a sense. Um, because I work on the computer to compose my imagery, uh, I have all these files associated with each painting. I have Illustrator, Photoshop files, even Word documents with work plans and things like that. And I kind of thought a couple of years ago, I have all this you know, data associated with the work. Why not use it to make other things essentially? So these graphite drawings are very, very recent. And um, they're basically drawings of, of the outlines of all the shapes in the painting. Um, here's a detail of one of them. Um, all horizontal and vertical lines basically. Um, the third element are these sculptures, which again are derived from the files for the painting, believe it or not. Um, and it's kind of a, a lengthy process to get there, but um, it's basically taking a grayscale image of the painting, bringing it into a 3D modeling program, wrapping it around a sphere, manipulating it so that dimensionality relates to the values of the painting. Um, and I did a bunch of these, they're 3D printed in porcelain and then glazed and fired. Here's a couple of those. And then these new lithographs, um, I was invited to go to Sharks Inc. in Lyons, Colorado. Um, Bud Shark has been making prints with artists for 40 something years. Um, and he's worked with people all over the country and all over the world. And right after I moved to Santa Fe, he invited me up and it was perfect timing. Um, I haven't done a lot of printmaking, but it's, um, I love working with a new medium. It just really opens things up and presents new challenges and, you know, the limitations and lack of limitations in any new medium is kind of exciting to play around with. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the thoughts behind my work. Um, as I said, I went to CalArts and it was a place where painting was very much kind of under assault, CalArts is 
really one of the leading kind of conceptual art theory based grad programs and I ended up there and felt like I'd been you know bludgeoned by everybody in the school so um I think it was a great experience because it I don't take anything for granted in painting. It's something where I'm thinking all the time about what does it mean now? It's supposedly such an outmoded, outmoded form of expression. And yet I think there's still a lot of potential to kind of move it forward. So I'm always thinking about, you know, the digital world that we live in now and very much about painting history. And I have a few questions that are kind of in the back of my mind all the time. Um, one is how do I make a relevant abstract painting in this age that we live in with this excessive digital stimulus that we're so immersed in all the time. And the fact that abstraction is, is you know, a pretty old modality. It's been around for over a hundred years. Um, everyone has kind of beaten the dead horse. You know, how do you kind of continue that lineage in an interesting way? Um, another thing I think about, um, at what point do algorithmic systems facilitate a new form of expression? Again, I kind of feel like, you know, the computer is something that can allow me to do something that I would not do if I was not using it. Um, and how are my personal impulses and aesthetic decisions being filtered through computer programs, which are themselves based in existing things. So Photoshop is supposed to be like a photo studio and a painting studio. Illustrator is supposed to be a, you know, um, your cut and paste graphic design desk, you know, so they're uh, things that are familiar, but with so much more power and potential than the old fashioned way, analog way of doing things, right? Um, and finally, at what point does mathematical and geometric data become kind of naturalized where it doesn't look artificial anymore? It looks like it comes from me as a maker. <clears throat> Here's where I spend a lot of my time. <laughs> And uh, lastly, um, I'm a big fan of Sherry Turkle's writing. She's an MIT professor who's one of the very first people to write about that interface of technology and our, our human interaction with technology. Um, and she stated almost 40 years ago that, you know, computers are basically objects to think with. They precipitate thought. They are changing the way that we think essentially, which I think is fascinating. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through the exhibition that I had right after on the heels of the Alcove exhibition. And in fact, it was delayed because of COVID. It opened um, in July last summer um, at Robichon Gallery in Denver. And similarly, um, the exhibition is based on this giant 28 foot long painting. Um, and all the other objects in the show are directly kind of pulled from, derived from the files for this painting. So there's um, four graphite drawings, uh, three of the bronze sculptures. In this case, they're much larger than the porcelain um, and cast in bronze. Three new paintings. And the drawings in this case are extremely dense, much more so than the ones in the alcove show. And here's a detail of one of them. And you're doing that by hand? Yeah. <laughs> Very crazy making and not good for your hand either. Um, and the three new paintings. And then the bronzes, um, you know, one drawback of the porcelain is kind of a lack of uh, resolution because the glaze kind of softens everything. So the bronzes um, have this extreme detail um, where some of the line elements are kind of emerging to the surface of these things. Um, and, you know, I think of them almost like seeds that contain the DNA of the painting or almost like meteors where you've wrapped up the painting and rolled it into a ball and shot it into outer space and it's kind of charred and damaged. And here's a just last shot. I took this shot a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've been very busy making some new work for my next show with Eli Ridgeway Gallery in Bozeman, which will open uh, at the end of May. So there you go. Thank you. Okay.
Thanks, Amy. And I, I think Eli might be watching. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, something that I think I was so glad when Deborah asked about, said something about how you do those by hand, because um, I think that's something that's not as obvious um, when you look at the work. And there really is in both of your work, this kind of um, high level of hand skill with um, kind of technology in different ways, whether that's casting or um, you know, using algorithms, which then ultimately become cast. So I think that is um, really interesting, but those encaustic paintings are generated on the computer, but manufactured yes. by Amy. <laughs> Yes, sorry, I should have said that. I uh, Everything is extremely, you know, the digital part is just fast as lightning and a lot of fun and I'm noodling around on the computer. And then when I decide, okay, I'm committing to this painting for the next, you know, six months or however long it takes to make the thing, it's very slow, it's very painstaking, it's very traditional and archival and very much rooted in tradition and, there's not much going on in my paintings that haven't been going on in paintings for 500 years in terms of the way that they're made. Um, and I think like Deborah, there's that, that the joy of making, the joy of the physical involvement, um, the mastery of you know, technique and just making that is such a part of it. And for me, it's in contrast to you know, the digital, we're so kind of disengaged physically and it's kind of like my last gasp of, you know, hanging on to life in a sense. Um, you know, I'm fascinated by the digital, but I also see the pitfalls um, and I'm kind of walking a tightrope there, I think. Well, the your kind of conceptual hybrid is very much similar to Deborah's kind of physical hybrid you know, um, how you're pairing, Nat and Deborah, you're pairing the kind of very um, organic with something that's very manufactured. Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of that. Um, yeah, I used to, there was a period where I just carved stone and then I just uh, broke out and started wanting to make other parts attach or the crystals look like they're growing out. Um, but I think the other similarity I was is how much we're both rooted in tradition of our crafts mm -hmm. and like knowing where we live in the history of that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in a way, maybe commenting on it because I sometimes am like, oh my gosh, my bust pieces are making sculptures about sculptures. And you know, the same thing right. in, in painting where you're making paintings about paintings. Mm -hmm. about the I think also it's so interesting to hear you talk about, you know, magic and strength and things like that, which are so much a part of your work. And, you know, for me, abstract painting is the magic and strength of painting more than anything else. And I'm kind of obsessed with like, how do you, how do you stay in this lineage that, you know, is, by some arguments, you know, stale and over, is there a way to kind of like touch that magic a little bit? I think there's a bit of a crossover there. I yeah, was just, I, oh, yeah. Go, go oh, ahead. sorry. I just was going to say, I thought, although I use, you know, found objects, I still keep going back to like stone and bronze, which I think I mean, at least bronze on some levels in super contemporary art where you use a lot of like found objects or like what my professors at Bard used to call slap dash. They, it, it, it's not always cool to work in bronze. Like, do you know what I mean? Or to make beautiful things mm -hmm. <laughs> that matter. Not cool at all. <laughs> we are not cool. You know, it's funny, um, I, I had really no, not much of an intention of doing bronze until I moved to Santa Fe. And I think, um, I do feel that there's been an opening, you know, a lot of people are like, what's gonna happen to your work when you live here? And I thought, oh, probably nothing because my work isn't that informed by my immediate environment. And yet, um, I think one thing that did happen is it's the first time in about 20 years that I haven't had an assistant. So I'm actually 
really alone all day, every day in here. And it did kind of open up the door to working in different mediums. And I think, you know, you see a lot of sculpture around town here and that was part of it. I do have a background in sculpture actually, but I haven't made any in 30 years. And uh, I think it's just, um, I think life does seep in no matter what, you know, there's, there's no way, even if you think it's not, it is. <laughs> How do you think the pandemic affected your work or did it? I mean, we all have ways it affected us personally, but. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I've been working on this show um, since October, I think, it's late September or October. And actually the painting that's behind me as my background, uh, the work is really dense. And hmm. I just kind of, you know, some of my work, I kind of float between things that are more open and things that are more just like really rot and fraught. And in this case, it just went kind of wild. Um, and, you know, I think it maybe takes a little bit of distance to kind of step back and say, oh, what was I thinking then when I made this body of work? But I think the, um, there's a lot of complex feelings we all experienced this past year and um, I'm sure some of it's in here you know there's no way around it yeah and I've been even before the pandemic I was doing work about grief but it's I find it interesting even more now I'm diving into like what does grief mean and how do you transform how do you make grief into something sacred that can then go on to transform and change the world or yourself yeah. Um, we've, we've got some questions in our question box, so I thought I would get to some of those. But one of the comments is, and I don't know if you guys would want to do this, if we could, while we're going through the questions, just scroll through the slides again so people could see the work. Okay. And we, um, so we could, why don't we start, Amy, with you? Okay. Um, and only because I have two questions in the Q&A that relate. And then we'll move forward. And I, I have a question because I'd love to know a little bit more about that heart when we get to, to the beginning of yours, Deborah. And I don't, I don't want to cut off any um, other conversation, but um, one of the questions, and I think they relate together and may have been answered for you, is how do you output or print the large paintings? <laughs> and can you talk about the relationship between uh, the 2D and 3D work. Yeah. Um, and then there's another question here somewhere that I can't find now about templates. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, so the paintings are basically designed in Illustrator, I mean, in most in Photoshop based on forms that were originally uh, designed in Illustrator. Um, after many, many years of doing this, I have these millions of what we'll call layers that are basically kind of like modules of chopped up forms. So every color you see would be a layer um, in a Photoshop document. Um, once I decide to make the painting, um, then I rework all of that as a vector file in, Illust in Illustrator. And then those are um, output as stencils that I use to kind of paint through. In the old days, up until just a few years ago, it was all like I'd project it on a piece of paper, use transfer paper, trace around everything with a pounce wheel, tape everything off, you know, extremely labor intensive. It still is, but I'm not having to masking tape every little shape like I used to. Um, every, so everything is painted by hand on panel um, in oil paint. And then that final layer of the painting, you can see the surface of this, that more textural layer is encaustic. There's a clear layer of encaustic on top of the oil. And then this, you know, dimensional forms where basically I kind of think of it as these shapes are kind of emerging spatially through the planes of the painting. Um, and it just gives a little bit of optical fizz when you're looking at it, those little edges. Um, the output um, for, for these is basically I'm projecting that vector file and drawing it. But what if you saw what I was projecting, you would be like, what? <laughs> you know, it doesn't look that obvious. Um, it's kind of, it kind of repixelates through the projector in a way. So I'm looking at 
something that is once again, very pixelated. Um, so there's a ton of like back and forth between, you know, analog and tech technological steps, which I think is really interesting. And then the sculptures, um, those I had somebody make for me, I'm making the files, um, again, working in a 3D modeling program. So I know exactly what they're gonna look like. And then they're literally 3D printed um, and, and glazed offsite and then just sent to me from the Ukraine, which is kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Now, <clears throat> if I'm correct on those drawings, the two drawings that we had up represented the four panels of the yes. painting. Yeah. So the first drawing is, uh, if you look at this painting carefully, there, it's made of four panels. All the um, because I work in encaustic, I have to, I can't work on an, uh, just a stretch canvas. It has to be a very firm surface. And you can kind of see these little demarcations in the surface of the painting. So the left two panels of the painting are this drawing and the right two panels are this one. So they're just conflated on top of each other. Um, the ones that I did for the Robichon show are actually four way um, symmetrical drawings of each of the pa panels of the giant painting. So I'm kind of multiplying, I'm doing, I'm making more alterations in the imagery before I draw it, essentially. I'm wondering, and this is, will be the last computer, well, there's one other computer question. Do, uh, is that amount of data, is what you're doing now something you maybe couldn't have done 10 years ago even because of all the calculation or has it, or have the calculations speeded up substantially? Well, that's a good question. I, um, you know, your typical, when I'm working in a Photoshop document, if the painting's 28 feet long, my document is 28 inches at 300 DPI. So they're big files. And in the olden days, I couldn't make such huge files. Um, now that's a pretty moderate size for a photo, you know, it's not enormous. Um, for my big public art piece at um, SFO, a mural that's 109 feet long, that was impossible to make in Photoshop at the time at a very high resolution. So yeah, definitely. Um, now I have a, a whole setup with a computer graphics card for the 3D imagery because my computer can't handle it. So yeah, I think the ability of the machine to handle all this data is definitely growing exponentially for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I'm looking at some of these other questions. So I have one more and then we're gonna move up Back to Deborah. So maybe Deborah, do you want to put your um, start pulling your, maybe your um, PowerPoint on? Um, so the, the comment uh, was, uh, Amy, do you approach painting like Ricardo Maisel and his use of the computer? Uh, I don't think I know Ricardo Maisel. I should look him up. <laughs> um, do you know him, Mary? I know the work. I didn't realize he used a computer. But of mm. course, I think about um, the computer and abstraction, and I think about Frederick Hammersley. So, of course, of course. You know, and, and you, you were know, kind what, enough to give a talk about how you use yeah. the computer in his show. One of my favorite painters is Al Held, and his late work looks like it was designed on a computer, and it wasn't. So, I think that that's um, super, super interesting. I mean, some people kind of hide their use of it, some people are just so mathematically brilliant that they can kind of make it look like they did that, but they didn't. Um, we're still in kind of this funny area where it's a little hard to know how people are making things. Okay, so I'm having trouble catching up with the questions. Um, so Deborah, you told me a great story when we were installing, I think it was when we were installing the show that you made a crystal radio with your grandpa. I Gosh, something it's, like it's that right over there in a box in my studio. My great or my mom's dad was actually an electrical gen engineer and he had one of those quartz crystal radios that you I don't know if you buy the kit first, but it actually has this little sliver of quartz in it. And um, I bring it to artist talks in in person because I find it, you know, even though there's a lot of metaphysical stuff and energy stuff that has to do with crystals. It actually is used in electronics. And that made a big impression on me when I was little. 
well, that they could generate or power. Uh, and I love this notion of um, the kind of growth and healing that you see that they're that's just implied, particularly by the corals. Well, the, those surreal, those juxtapositions. Uh, they they clarify the signal. Like without the quartz in it, it's 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 almost like it's between stations, but then it like clarifies it. So that's also the way it's thought about in in metaphysical thinking is like amplifying and clarifying your energy or so just to, I, I like to think of both because I think of myself as a very science-minded person but also kind of a little bit woo-woo so <laughs> so we have a do you want to kind of scroll through so everybody can see the images there's a comment here about how the ghost heart is so resonant uh, and as you were talking about that it took me a minute to really catch on to it. And there's so much beauty in some of the metaphor um, the, in the way you use the heart and then knowing about this ghost heart makes it that much more uh, resonant. Yeah, I mean, I, in all honesty, I wanted to do some heart related things probably 20 years ago, but it's so cliche and cheesy. But then I came across this, I actually came across the ghost heart through Dario Robledo's artist talk. And he was one of my grad school professors. So then we communicated about, do, is it okay if I do work about this? Cause he was doing work about it. Although his was totally different. Um, but you, it's really worth looking up the video of when you see it, uh, you know, a white translucent heart beat. It's like, <laughs> you, like it's, it's unbelievable. But yeah, that's, that's what these are about. Even though I do think I have a really cheesy gooey heart. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I do think it's okay to make beautiful art. Yes. Yeah. I know that sounds crazy to most people, but if you went to grad school. But, but you know that yeah. all art doesn't have to be beautiful, you know, in the same way that all films don't have to have happy endings to be good films. Right? Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. This yeah, other piece. Uh, I'm glad you were showing this because you talked about the ready-made and the found object. And the other thing that you had told me that I found so interesting about this is that uh, abalone shell is from buttons. Yeah, yeah. I wish I had 10 more of them. Such a beautiful- I carried that around for like 10 years before I figured out what to do, <laughs> do with it. So I just think it's so beautiful. It's like uh, the heart becomes almost like a crab. I don't know, the associations of the, um, al the abalone and the heart and that piece of kind of salty marble. I have a real- Yeah, it's Kind of physical, yeah. emotional connections. I wanted to make one le more like weird and on its side instead of, so like, look at this pretty heart, you know. Okay. I wanted to mess with it a little bit more. And then the gesture of those hands is gorgeous. I want to make more of these. I love this idea. I think it's so beautiful. Those Victorians knew, knew what was going on in some ways. I mean, they didn't in some ways, but. <laughs> well, I, you know, with the pandemic, I was wondering if some of these things that we think of as kind of frivolous and Victorian and outmoded, if maybe they had we're somehow related to germs, you know, like the <laughs> covers on the sleeves of sofas and all those things, this prudishness and covering up. Yeah. Um, that was one of my pandemic thoughts, but it's founded on nothing. Yeah, I, I, for some reason, I feel like for how, I, I'm always like frustrated about how women were expected to act during that time or what they were expected to wear. Um, but yet I'm really interested in their morning jewelry, morning practices, wearing, um, wearing black clothing for a year after your husband dies. I mean, it's, it seems so over the top. And they're cur I have a big interest in, what is it called? Curiosity collections. Um, they're interested in weird things. So we have a question here that says, uh, how does Deborah make her molds that are then cast in glass or resin? I love this work. Um, they're made out of wax. 
that or that yeah so it's it's just like casting bronze you have the original out of wax and then you put plaster silica over it um then you steam the wax out with a uh, wallpaper steamer turn upside down either put glass depending on the size of the opening if you can stick glass in it and then you put it in the kiln or you use a flower pot stick glass in it it was, I had a, a residency at Bullseye Glass and learned how to do it. And they have great online videos. If you wanna figure it out. That artist residency program there is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you learn a lot. I mean, it took me till years later to totally get it. And then I got so hooked that I'm like, I think I need a kiln so I can do this at home, but. You're not the first artist who I think that has happened. Um, yeah. There's another comment here that says, Deborah, 30 pieces in 30 days. How is that even possible? I did 100 pieces in 100 days. That was cuckadoodle. And we were traveling the whole time. But yeah, how no, you just do it, man. You, you just, I mean, half of them are going to suck and it's totally fine. Like, that's, that's the fun of it. It's like, it's just pure experiment. You, if you have a deadline, you just, you just do it. And then I think the funny thing about social media for me is if once I say I'm going to do something, I will do it because I think all these people are out here waiting for my image every day, even though no one probably we were, we were. <laughs> It's like, um, I find, you know, the problem is when you're busting out a piece a day, it takes enough time that you can't do a longer project very well. So it's either one or the other. I have to say, I was super inspired by what you were doing. Um, I had, I think the first, I don't know, there was a period of a few weeks where, when it really became clear that, oh God, this could last for a year. You know, I knew my show was going to be delayed. I, you know, everybody stopped working. The framer's not working. The foundry's not working. You're like, oh great. Everything's screeching to a halt. And I kind of felt like I found it hard to work for a few weeks and that's just not like me. I literally work seven days a week most of the time. So I, when I was seeing what you were doing, I was like, oh God, I wish I could do that. But I don't really think that way. And it's just, um, I don't know. I found it really, really inspiring. And I was super happy that you, I was waiting for it every day. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it, I, you know, I also think I use my art a lot. Just by, this is how I deal with my anxiety. Like I had, when I was doing a hundred days of sculpture, I had my cousin died in the middle of it. And I, I was working so much, I didn't even deal with it. And then when I, after the last day, I just was like a mess. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. This is like being a workaholic or not feeling your feelings by putting them somewhere else. So, you know constructive could be problematic I don't know <laughs> constructive sublimating I'm all in favor of that <laughs> but it you know it kept my I mean and I ended up being on the the gal that had the idea a uh, Danielle uh Krista's podcast the jealous curator because I just was so grateful to her because I was losing my mind at the beginning of the pandemic and this idea to do this kind of saved me Wow. Well, I, I think a lot of us just had to get, I, and I've talked to tons of artists about this. I think so many of us had to get to the point like, oh, we just have to do what we do. We can't fix this problem. We can't, you know, we don't need to change. I think a lot of people are like, what am I going to do to help and solve? And, you know, and I think, you know, really we came to the conclusion that the best thing we can do is just keep doing what we normally do. I th yeah, I did sense that. Like, why is what I do important? I mean, when really bad things are going on in the world. Um, I did, uh, with my, I make jewelry too, raise a lot of money for Navajo Nation and their COVID. That felt really good. But yeah, I didn't, you know, it was the same for me. But I think it's easy to forget how much we contribute to culture, like what we're actually doing. Um, I don't know, because everybody's like, why do I do this? Some days are like, why, why? We're crazy, but I think, I would like to think we make the world a better place. 
I think you're, I think you're right. And, um, you know, I, I think if this was even five months ago, we would have been deep into, po into post alcove three, as I like to think it, of it, or pandemic. And um, I don't think I would have wanted to have this conversation because it would have felt like we weren't gonna emerge mm -hmm. from there. You know, I mean, you know, I think I wouldn't have, when we were talking about what to do, I don't think it would have come up because I think we were still so in it. And so mm -hmm. I think now because of time, but also because of progress maybe, we can have some hindsight. And I, and I, I do think those kind of repetitive projects are, um, they take your mind off things, but they also, like you said, can open up new ideas and new ways of working you hadn't thought about if you're being too careful. Yeah, which I can get. <laughs> okay. Oh, here's another um, technical question, which is, Amy, how can you put wax on an oil painting? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> that is a very good question. The oil, lay first of all, I, as I said, I work on a panel. Um, the panel is has a layer of unbleached cotton muslin adhered with rabbit skin glue, and then like you know six layers or so of uh, traditional chalk gesso, and then it's a super super absorbent, beautiful, luscious ground. Um, the oil paint layers are extremely thin and flat. They're not impasto. They're not dimensional. They're not scumbly. They're very, very clean and flat and very thin for the most part. Um, and the encaustic just adheres to it. Um, it just, I mean, they are compatible. Um, so the clear layer of encaustic is very, very thin, just thick enough to create, it's almost like a little window pane on top of the painting. Um, it also creates a tiny little barrier because the dimensional shapes, when I'm shaping them, I paint them with a brush. As you probably know, encaustic is, you know, not wet or dry, it's liquid or solid. And so when it's liquid, it's really, really liquid and it's very messy. Um, it's hard to paint it cleanly and perfectly. So I scrape around all of those shapes with a razor blade and shape it all. And that's really the most time consuming part of making the painting. Um, but yeah, it all is archival and compatible. And very traditional. Yeah. <clears throat> Although I would say I used encaustic in a very non-traditional way. Um, I mean, traditionally, it's almost applied more like a like watercolor. It's supposed to be a little sloppy, a little transparent. Um, if you look at the old Roman, you know, the casket portraits on little wood panels, they almost look like watercolor the way that they're painted. Um, and so to do it in kind of a hard edge way is is kind of not what it is good at doing. Right, no, I meant all the layers of prep, the, the, there's so much painting tradition in the prep of those panels with the chalk um, gesso and the rabbit skin glue and all that business. So, okay, well, I'm gonna encourage people to send some more questions our way. Um, do you guys have questions for one another? that we haven't already asked? You know, the, the one, I don't know if this is a question, this is more a comment. Part of like why I was drawn to Amy is we both moved here roughly the same time. I moved here from being in Seattle 20 years almost and she moved here from San Francisco. And this, I find the choice, this isn't about our art, but, but the choice to leave a large city and come and live here and, and practice is, uh, and how much we love it here. And we're just a similarity. Yes, yeah. And I don't know about you, but the, the whole entire past year, every day of my life, I just thought, thank goodness I'm here and not in San Francisco because my studio building was closed down for three months. Our, you know, of course our living quarters were minuscule, you know, just to have space and the landscape and the light and you know the horses and the dogs and just like all the stuff that's kind of around you at all times here um it just was such a gift to be able to have that space i mean i, I would have lost my mind if i'd been in san francisco during covid 
Oh, I, I, I have the same. I had friends that living that in various cities be like, you made good timing leaving, although I'd been here longer, but good, you know, you're lucky that you're not stuck here, especially Manhattan when it was really bad. But um, to be able to go for walks and safely, oh, it's just such a like, I don't know what it is about that's so magic about Santa Fe. I don't know. It's like some magic spiritual place or I can't even put it into words. So great cool lady there. who works with crystals. <laughs> I know. I'm yep. Magic's everywhere. Even the well, sky. I, I always say the gravity is stronger and the sky is higher here. You know, like there's just kind of even if you're not woo-woo, you kind of are very aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't I don't see any other questions. Um, I want to thank you both so much, not only for, for tonight, but you also did some of our first virtual programming during the first couple weeks of the pandemic, uh, where we did these kind of one minute interviews where they started out with, hello, what do you do? It's time to, <laughs> time to sign off. So uh, I appreciate that too. And um, your participation in, of course, the Alcove exhibition and um, your participation in the art scene in Santa Fe. So thank you so much. Can I say thank one you. more? I I just wanted to thank FOCAP and uh, New Mexico Museum of Art because um, what yeah, our opening was such an amazing, generous thing where all the old old Al alcove artists came out and it was like being welcomed into the community in this very beautiful way that I feel really blessed to have been a part of. Yeah. I'll second that. It was amazing. And uh, as you said, Deborah, it just was really kind of the last fun thing we did, you know, literally. The door slammed the next day, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, thank God it happened, or thank goodness it happened. Yeah. Um, sure. Anyway, I think that we should be being joined maybe in a minute by um, Sean. Yay. All right, thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Sean. Yes, hi, that was great, everyone. I really enjoyed that. And I don't know about everyone else who was listening, but I took lots of notes. So there'll be things to look up about, you know, a ghost heart and all kinds of your processes, Amy. I'm, I'm excited to look into all of this. It was really great to hear about. And I wanna thank everyone uh, for joining us tonight, for being here and for continuing to support our FOCAP programming um, as members. We hope to see you many, many more times in the future and both on the web and in person. And let's keep all our fingers crossed that in person happens sooner than we'd like to not think. <laughs> so don't forget also about our May 4th webinar um, about the show Breathtaking with Catherine Ware and Jill O'Brien. I think it'll be really great. And um, we enjoyed tonight so much. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>